today's story time is going to be about Dr. Martin Luther King, who will be celebrating his birthday this coming Monday. Dr. King was born January 15th, 1929, and he would have been 92 years of age this year. Did you know that Dr. King's birthday became a federal holiday in 1983, but wasn't officially celebrated in all 50 states until the year 2000? And his birthday here in the United States is celebrated commonly on the third Monday of January each year. And there was a song written about his birthday by Stevie Wonder, who was also the champion of getting Dr. King's birthday made a holiday in the first place. And that song is commonly known now as the birthday song, and I'm sure most of you have heard it before, um, sent to you or a relative every year on their birthday. That was also released in 1980. Now today we're going to be reading I Am Dr. Martin Luther King by Brad Metzler. Who's that kid who can travel through time? Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum. Which great heroes will we find? Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum. Every single boy and girl has what it takes to change the world. This has really cool pictures in here. And this is showing Dr. King as a little kid, but as you notice, he still has a mustache, and he's still wearing his suit. <laughs> Sadly enough, I think if Dr. King was a child, I still imagine he would still be wearing that suit. I think not, it's hard to imagine him in regular kid clothes. It, it's, it's crazy. Alright, it says, I am Martin Luther King Jr., and it shows him in the church, which is where he grew up, where his father was a pastor. And that church is called Ebenezer Baptist Church. When I was little, I used to get into a lot of accidents. One day, my little brother hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Two other times, I mistakenly got knocked over by a car. Another day, I tumbled over our banister and then bounced through an open door into the basement. You see that? He was what we call accident prone. No matter how many times I fell, I kept getting back up. Even before I could read, I knew I liked books. My dad always talked about how I kept a lot of books around me, and I used to tell my parents there was power in words, and big words were in my future. When I was six years old, one of my best friends was a boy whose father owned a store across the street. But when we started going to school, Everything changed. He went to a school where all the kids were white, and I went to a school where everyone was black. And soon after, he told me, and he says, I can't play with you anymore. And he, Martin Luther King says, why? And the little boy said, my dad said so. I didn't understand. It didn't make sense. And it's basically back in the 60s and early 50s, and be even before that, black kids and white kids weren't allowed to play together. But my parents told me to do the opposite, that I should love my friends even though they hurt me. They taught me that it's better to have more love in your life than more hate. And then my mother taught me one of the most important lessons of all. You are as good as anyone. You must never feel that you are less than anyone else. And Martin said, I wanted to believe it, but every day I saw the opposite. I saw you could be treated unfairly just because of the color of your skin. And if you were white, you went into a good school with great playgrounds and plenty of books. But if you were black, your school was small, sometimes with no desks or even windows. Can you imagine, kids, what it would look like if you went to school and you didn't even have a desk to do your homework or your, a window to look out of? It wasn't just the schools black people had to use different water fountains, different elevators, even different bathrooms. In fact, on a hot day when everyone wanted ice cream, if you were white, you could just sit at the counter and eat from a nice dish. But since I was black, if 
they served me and all. It was through a side window, and they put my ice cream in a flimsy paper cup. It got even worse when I was 14. I just had won a speech competition, and my speech was about being fair to all people. I was so excited, and then on the bus ride home, a few white people got on board. At first, I stayed put. It didn't seem fair, but my teacher convinced me to move. We spent the rest of the ride standing and getting tossed in every direction. I became the valedictorian of my high school. When you're valedictorian in Georgia, you get invited to meet the governor of Georgia. It was a Sunday morning. We got dressed, put on our best clothes, and got on the bus because we didn't have a car. We get to the guard gate, and the guard looks at me, and he looks at my parents, and he says, this is a private event. You don't belong here. And my dad says, no, no, this is my daughter, Stacy. She's one of the valedictorians. But the guard, I remember very clearly him looking over our shoulders at the bus that's pulling away. And he looks back at us and he basically says, he's like, no, you don't belong here. Every day, this is what life was like. Black people were treated terribly. And the only question was, what could I do about it? At the age of 15, I started college. He was really smart. By 19, I became a minister and entered seminary school to study religion. In no time at all, I got my chance. In Alabama, a black woman named Rosa Parks was told to give up her bus seat to a white man. It was just like what happened to me. But unlike me, Miss Parks refused. She was arrested. Early the next morning, I got a phone call from a local community leader. And there's those Miss Rosa Parks in the picture. It was just like the road taught. Instead of using violence to protest the unfair rules, black people would, would use a peaceful method. We would not ride the public buses. Without our money, the bus companies would go out of business. Now, the only question was, would it work? On the first day of the protest, my wife called me to the window. And she said, look, Martin, the buses are all empty. It's working. But we had to keep it going. As head of the bus boycott, I had to give one of the most important speeches of my life. The room was packed. Camera crews were filming. I had only 20 minutes to prepare. I didn't use notes, but speaking from my heart, I found out how big words can be. And that's Dr. King giving his speech. See all the people. The police put me in jail saying I was breaking the law. Other folks bombed my house, but instead of using my fist, I kept my calm. For more than a full year, every black person in the city, and some white people too, refused to ride the buses. That meant some people had to walk for miles, but they kept going. There was a power in standing together. Eventually, our peaceful protest worked. The rules were changed, and public buses could no longer separate people based on color of their skin. But that was only the beginning. Soon, our peaceful protest sparked other peaceful protests at lunch counters. College students organized sit-ins where they would not stop until everyone could eat together. And our methods of nonviolence were so powerful. I was invited to meet with the president at the White House. But sometimes the hardest problems were right at home. Seeing my daughter cry was one of the most painful moments of my life. It only made me work harder for change. It was, was it easy? Absolutely not. During one protest in Birmingham, Alabama, the police again arrested me and locked me in a dark jail cell that only had one window. Someone slipped me a newspaper in which white religious leaders had written an article calling us lawbreakers. Someone then stuck me, snuck me a pen, and in that jail cell, I wrote my own response in the margins of the newspaper and even on toilet paper. My letter from the Birmingham jail was soon published as a pamphlet. Then it was in magazines and newspapers. 
Today has been read by millions of people, and like I said, it is amazing how big words can be. Our message was so important, even kids your age joined us. In Birmingham, during the Children's Crusade, more than 1,000 kids, some as young as six years old, showed up to march. See, little kid? The first day, the police arrested 900 of them. The next day, 2,500 children showed up ready to go to jail. This was our finest hour. Enraged that we were not giving up, the chief of police told the firemen to spray the children with water hoses and attack them with dogs. They thought that would stop us, but instead, as the whole country watched on TV what they were doing to our children, it was a wake-up call to the nation's conscience. Ninety days later, the rules began to change. Now, blacks and whites in Birmingham were using the same lunch counters, water fountains, and restrooms. You could feel it in the air. More change was coming. Freedom was contagious. By the summer of 1963, an estimated one million Americans held their own protests in cities across the country and a man named A. Philip Randolph suggested a massive march. People came from across every state. They came nearly from every form of transportation. They even took off work and did not get paid just to be there. Old people, young people, black people, white people, even children like you, they all came to Washington, D.C., gathering in a righteous army. Why? because they wanted change, and because they knew the surest way to change the world is to stand together. So on August 28, 1963, I stood at the podium and spoke what some later called my biggest words of all. And that is the I Have a Dream speech. And I'm sure most of you have heard that speech before. After the march on Washington, the President and Congress passed new laws for civil rights, but that didn't mean our work was done. Indeed, our greatest battle was still to come. It began with 600 activists as they tried to walk 54 miles from Selma, Alabama to the state capital of Montgomery. Back then, there were rules that stopped black people from voting, and if you wanted to change the laws, you would have to be able to vote for new people to make the laws. The police had billy clubs and tear gas. They attacked our group and knocked many people down. But as I learned long ago, you have to get back up. No matter how hard they hit us, we remained peaceful, and still we didn't get through. Two days later, we tried again. Now there were 2,500 of us. Once again we tried. Once again we did not get through. Did we give up? What do you guys think? Did they give up? Nope. <laughs> it was Sunday, March 21st, 1965, on our third try. Now we had 8,000 people with us. For two days we marched. Rain could not stop us. The world was watching. The White House was too. And President Johnson even sent the troops to protect us. Exhaustion could not stop us. As we reached Montgomery, Alabama, tears were shed, and this time they were tears of joy. In my life, people tried to tell me I wasn't as good as they were just because of the color of my skin. And when someone hurts you like that, it can be tempting to hurt them back, but you must refuse. When someone shows you hate, you show them love. When someone shows you violence, you show them kindness. To reach our goals, we must walk the path of peace. We must lock arms with our brothers and sisters, and we must march together when we do. Our voices will be heard, and freedom will reign. I am Martin Luther King, Jr. I stand for peace. I stand for justice. I stand to help others. I stand that, that there is proof, no matter how hard the struggle, we must fight for what is right and work to change what is wrong. Whatever the struggles you face, 
No matter how hard it gets, you must always move forward. I am proof of this. If we rise up, if we stand together, and if we remain united, nothing can stop our dreams.